Toyota entered Formula 1 in 2002, but did not win a race and never finished higher than 4th in the Constructors' Championship in 8 seasons. In 2009, the same year it established itself as the world's biggest car manufacturer, Toyota walked away from F1 as arguably the biggest failure in Grand Prix history given the sky-high expectations and billions spent. Three pole positions and 13 podium finishes in 139 Grand Prix was a disastrous return for a company that had everything it needed to succeed. So why did it fail? After success in the World Rally Championship during the 1990s and producing the quick and iconic but ultimately unsuccessful GT1 sports car, it was natural Toyota turned its attention to F1. But this was a time when F1 teams were rapidly expanding in size and technical know-how, and by coming in as a full works operation, producing both car and engine, Toyota faced a double challenge. Toyota initially planned a V12 engine, but in January 2000, prompted by lobbying from teams who feared the looming threat of Toyota, rules mandating the use of V10 engines were finalised. This was used as the official reason for Toyota delaying its planned entry from 2001 to 2002, but realistically, the company never seriously intended to make the grid for that first year, given it was starting from nothing and was happy to write off its $11 million deposit. But it invested plenty of time and money in a V12 project it had to scrap. Not the last time Toyota would lose out politically. Toyota instead spent 2001 testing. Its test car was heavy and well down on downforce. Unveiled on March 23, 2001, the car went on to log over 20,000 kilometres. The struggles led to the departure of technical director André de Cortins and the recruitment of Gustave Brunner from Minardi to replace him. Brunner was highly rated as a designer, but not considered ideal technical director material for a team that required strong leadership in that area. While its first season in 2002 with the new TF102 was downplayed as a learning year, its haul of two points, including Mika Salo's sixth place on the team's debut in Australia, wasn't considered good enough. This should have been recognised as a warning of how much still needed to be done, but was instead partly seen as underachievement, even though the car had few upgrades and the focus switched early to the TF103, a car heavily inspired by the 2002 Ferrari. There was at least recognition early on that the staff levels demanded of F1 necessitated a dramatic increase of the operation's headcounts, further proof the challenge was underestimated at first. Toyota had a tendency to point the finger at drivers when it came to underperformance. During the early testing programme, drivers Mika Salo and Alan McNish were told by a member of the Toyota board who was watching that they weren't braking as late as the quicker cars running, failing to recognise that they had a lot less downforce to contribute to the stopping power. While Toyota never had a genuine superstar driver, Jano Trulli, Olivier Panis and Ralph Schumacher were all Grand Prix winners, while the other six drivers to race a Toyota Salo, McNish, Cristiano De Matta, Timo Glock, Ricardo Zonta and Kamui Kobayashi all had fine CVs. None of them did a perfect job, but this mindset proved disruptive and distracted from getting to the real heart of the problem. For Toyota, its cars winning in F1 was never enough. It needed its whole corporate ideology to prevail. The Toyota way is a comprehensive philosophy that encapsulates a culture and way of doing things well honed for its more conventional road car and associated products, but it was not compatible with the demands of F1. This was at the heart of the criticism of the Toyota F1 team as being too corporate, insistent on taking its approach into F1 rather than adapting to meet the unique requirements of its new environment. Decision making was considered to be too slow, with personnel who had thrived elsewhere feeling constrained by this corporate straitjacket, honed in a world that moves at a very different pace to the short, sharp F1 season. This played a part in the failure to recruit enough F1 personnel early on. Some had F1 experience, but not enough. Initially, the team was led by former rally driver Ove Anderson, who had proved his prodigious skills as a team boss in rallying and sports cars, but who crucially didn't have F1 experience and wasn't given the support he deserved with other senior recruitments. Toyota also curbed the flashes of individual brilliance any team must harness to win. Inevitably, 
These problems were reflected in both the chassis and engine departments. Things started to pick up when Mike Gascoigne was brought in from Renault in December 2003 as technical director. He laid the foundations for a 2005 season that proved to be Toyota's best, with five podium finishes for Ralf Schumacher and Jarno Trulli, and fourth in the championship. Toyota very publicly set its sights on beating Ferrari in 2006 and challenging for its first victory, but after a difficult start to the season, Gascoigne was sacked. This highlighted several problems. Gascoigne was axed for a number of reasons, but throughout his time there, he did face resistance for not doing things in the Toyota way. His more confrontational style didn't sit well with the culture, so he was always going to be vulnerable if results weren't good enough. While in 2005, you couldn't dispute his effectiveness, in 2006 the underlying problems came to a head in a campaign not helped by a first attempt at a V8 engine that wasn't up to the standard of those produced by Mercedes and Renault. But the key reason Toyota didn't press on in 2006 and failed to build on the previous year was a decision imposed by Japan to switch from Michelin to Bridgestone rubber against the wishes of the technical team. While it worked well for Toyota as a wider company commercially, this didn't mesh with the suspension concept that was carried over on the TF106, which was very much an evolution of its predecessor and played a key role in its struggles that year. The needs of the F1 team played second fiddle to the wider concerns of Toyota, yet the team was still somehow expected to beat Ferrari. Another problem was that following Gascoigne's departure, Toyota reverted to a more consensus-based approach at a time when the team was well-placed to bring in a big-name technical director to take it to the next level. It needed another forceful personality able to make Toyota realise the error of its ways. Perhaps most baffling, Toyota later failed even to pursue a clear opportunity to speak to Ross Braun, who instead joined Honda. Toyota eschewed the traditional approach to F1 of setting up a headquarters in the United Kingdom in favour of using its motorsport base in Cologne. While it was well equipped and heavily invested in, this made it more difficult to recruit. But even more problematic, communication with Toyota was slow, as decisions often had to be referred there, this created lag. One decision waiting a day for a response might seem trivial, but add up multiple such delays and you can lose a huge amount of time. Such flat-footedness has been commented on by many of those who worked at Toyota when it was in F1. There was also a feeling that the team was too focused on the factory operation and not enough on trackside requirements. McLaren had pioneered the race room concept at its headquarters with meetings taking place between factory personnel and those at the track, but there were cases where important work at the circuit was interrupted for lengthy meetings that those participating in reckoned usually involved too many people. Toyota was putting the cart of corporate culture before the racing horse. In Toyota's final years in F1, Pascal Vassalon led the technical side. As he has proved with a subsequent Toyota sports car project, he's another accomplished operator, but wasn't an established F1 technical director and didn't come from an aerodynamic background. Although the team made some encouraging progress under him, some inside the team felt it needed further strengthening with senior technical personnel. The failure to recognise that aerodynamics were overwhelmingly the most important battleground in F1 carried on through much of Toyota's time, but there were signs things were beginning to change in later years, with the willingness to adapt perhaps boosted by being beaten in the Constructors' Championship by new customer team Williams in 2007. In late 2007, Mark Gillen was brought in as head of aerodynamics, with Frank Derny consulting and, under Vassalon's technical leadership, things did start to look up. The Toyota TF108 was an all-new car and showed significant aero gains. As F1's aero war raged, Toyota was still slow to adapt its development processes to look away from peak downforce figures and ensure it delivered a car that worked well across a range of conditions. But in 2008, the car was less pitch sensitive and it looked like the team was finally heading in the right direction. While there were still weaknesses in terms of aero efficiency, something that would carry over into 2009, Toyota appeared to be on the right trajectory and finally operating more like a modern F1 team. Yet during this period, Toyota also failed to play the engine politics game as well as it might have done. 
while Renault lobbied extensively and successfully to get brakes during the engine freeze era that was about to come in, Toyota, like Honda, was less willing to play this particular game. Toyota withdrew from F1 at the end of 2009 amid the global economic crisis, but that decision might have been very different had it delivered on the potential of what was a very quick car at times. The Toyota TF109 was, along with the Braun, the only car to have both a version of the controversial double diffuser and the front wing concept that would become de rigueur in F1. Toyota started the season with a very real shot at finally taking that breakthrough victory. Three podiums in the first four races could have been better, and when it locked out the front row in Bahrain and ran first and second with Glock and Trulli, a strategic error of moving onto the harder tyre at the first pit stops cost Toyota a shot at victory. The season started to go awry after the team proved to lack confidence with its Spanish Grand Prix upgrade, which it took off the car following practice, and it spent the middle stages of the season struggling. Some in the team felt Toyota's overly conservative approach was still holding it back, but at Spa, Toyota had probably its biggest missed opportunity. Trulli started second, but was, fuel corrected, fastest in qualifying before an electrical problem slowed his start and he picked up front wing damage in turn one. Without that, there was every chance of a straightforward victory. This precipitated a mini revival, with second places at Singapore for Glock and Trulli at Suzuka. But this wasn't enough to save Toyota in F1. Economic crisis or not, a win and the strong season that could have been would surely have persuaded Toyota to keep going. The hope was that the unraced Toyota TF110 would have represented another step forward, but Toyota's withdrawal means we will never know. What do you think? Is Toyota the biggest failure in F1 history given the expectations and investments, or was it on the brink of cracking it when it pulled the plug? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe.